Mass on the Preacher Night. If you're here with us live or if you're watching at home or from wherever else you might be watching, we are thankful that you're here with us. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce our panel here, but first, just a little bit about this event and kind of how it came to be and what our purpose is here. This, this whole thing was the brainchild of Gregory Films, and the purpose, as Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 14, is for the building up. He said that all things should be done unto edification, and this certainly falls under that umbrella. What we're going to kind of do this evening is ask the preacher Go figure, the name kind of says it all. So if you have questions here tonight, you're welcome to walk towards the outside of the aisles and address the microphone. Just tell us your name and what church you represent here. And you can do the same thing at home. You can just comment on that live link and Lord willing, those questions will get up to me. So again, thanks for tuning in. And as the Lord permits, I think this is gonna be a a nice night. So with that, I would like to introduce you to our panel of pastors. Uh, The gentleman immediately to my left here is Pastor Brian Carpenter with Tabernacle Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And Brian, if you just don't, uh, yeah, clapping would be appropriate. If you could just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, how long you've been pastoring, uh, where you've done training, even if it's not formal training, we trust that you learned the Bible somewhere, at least we hope, since you're part of our panel. Um, I, that wasn't like the trumpet sounding or anything. We're okay here. Um, I'm uh, pastor for about seven years. Uh, I'm a graduate of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Church in Country. I was originally ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA. I got myself thrown out in about 1999. Uh, no, about 2001, sorry. Um, I then moved to the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America, and I was a pastor of a PCA church in Sturgis, South Dakota for 13 years. I did a couple of years as a hospice chaplain in Omaha, Nebraska, before coming here in September of last year to take the pulpit of Tabernacle Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Excellent. Well, we're glad you're here with us. Uh, Next in the line there is Pastor Matt Mager of Sovereign Grace Chapel, which those of us that are here, that's where we're at tonight. If you're tuning in elsewhere, you didn't know that, but now you do. Pastor Matt. here at Sovereign Grace Chapel. We planted this church almost 14 years ago. Um, I have a wife named Bernie and uh, five children at home. Uh, did a Master of Divinity at the Master's Theological Seminary in Los Angeles. Um, currently doing a Doctor of Ministry program at the same school. So Lord willing, finish that up in a couple years. Excellent. And last but not least, Pastor Brian Etheridge of Poland Village Baptist. Welcome. Definitely a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I'm married. I have uh, three children, uh, one in graduate school, one in college, one in high school. Uh, I've been in Poland, Ohio, for the last uh, 10 years almost. I did my... um, uh, seminary work in Warsaw, Indiana. So all my children were born in Warsaw, Indiana, and I'm now a pastor in Poland, Ohio. <laughs> so the Lord definitely is uh, has his hand in my life and ministry. And so, like I said, it's a privilege to be here. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, we're glad that you're here, and I trust we're going to have some fun over the next hour, picking your brains a little bit here again for all of our benefit. It's just a little bit about, again, if you are tuning in with us at home, a few things you can do. You can like the YCTV page and then share that to your own personal wall. Again, if we're, we're trying to build everybody up here, and what a great opportunity to pick the brain of these men who have spent their lives and dedicated their lives to studying the Bible. So don't think any questions to too far out in left field. In fact, that might make things kind of interesting, so feel free to send those questions in. Uh, My name is Mick, and uh, just what a privilege it is for me to have been asked to host this tonight, and um, let's kind of dive in and see what we have for these guys. To open us up, uh, just ask you a simple why question. 
Those why questions are never actually simple, but why? Why Christianity? Why should I believe the Bible? What makes the Christian faith different than all those other faiths that are out there? I mean, everybody tends to believe what they believe rather passionately, so what makes you three guys think that you have it right? It's self-evidently true uh, that when you look at the Christian, well, there's really only one worldview that's even plausible, and that's what we call theism, the idea that there is a, a single God who created everything. And, uh, and then when you delve deeper into what the Christian faith actually teaches, it is just congruent with reality as we understand it. So I think it's self-evidently true. I think it's also true simply on the historical facts of the person of Jesus and what his life, death, and resurrection have accomplished in history. I guess I would say uh, the impossibility to the contrary. In other words, if you abandon uh, believing in Christian worldview, what the Bible teaches about just about anything, you can't make sense out of anything in this world. And so um, our starting point has to be the God. God who has revealed himself in the scriptures. For sure, I think there's the, uh, you know, the, the whole truth aspect to it. One of the things we, you want to hold on to in life is what's true, what's honest, what's verifiable, you know, what's historical, all those kind of things that you can uh, start to put together one right after another. And each path of that is going to lead you alone to one place, to Jesus Christ and uh, to the inerrant word of God and to the truth. And so if, you're, if your heart, um, if your mind, um, if your passion is to know the truth, um, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, um, will show himself, and that will be the, the route to go. Yeah, thanks for weighing in on that, guys. And forgive us for just a few of the audio difficulties that we're having. I'm going to have you guys scooch those microphones just a little bit closer to you, if you wouldn't mind. They look kind of heavy, but I think you can handle it. So why Christianity? And if I could just add, I, I heard uh, Vody Bauckham once say that uh, in, in regards to why he believes the Bible, he said, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses that report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecy and claims to have divine rather than human origin. So... We're not talking about blind faith here, are we? Oh, absolutely not, no. Okay. So you're all Christians now, right? <laughs> Another simple one here. Let's talk about free will. Let's talk about predestination. This is certainly a biblical concept. As we open up our Bibles, we can see those terms kind of littered in various places, but it's also, as you all know, somewhat controversial. So talk to us about predestination and talk about the tension that is clearly there between our personal responsibility and God's sovereignty. And maybe it would even be helpful for those here and tuning in to define some of those terms. Well, I think um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people uh, stumble over with predestination, they have a, f a few misconceptions of what we're actually asserting. One is that there are people who are dragged kicking and screaming into heaven, while there are others who are pounding on the door to be let in and God won't let them in, and that's simply not uh, what we're teaching. The next thing they think we're teaching is that human beings are simply uh, robots and that we don't have any of what the, um, the Westminster Standards call natural liberty. Uh, or the ability of a creature to move through the world and make decisions uh, and such. Um, and, and Calvinists have never asserted that at all. We assert very clearly that uh, creatures have natural liberty. They do make decisions. They do have a kind of free will um, in that they do what they want to do and uh, they don't do what they don't want to do. 
Um, and I, I think last of all would be there are a lot of people that appeal to some sort of quasi-American notion of fairness, that God somehow owes everybody the same opportunity, even though he actually gives everybody the same opportunity. He owes everybody the same chance, even though he gives everybody the same chance. In other words, God can't be sovereign and prefer one person over another. So I would say that um, all three of those are mistakes. And uh, we, get, we get there by smuggling in ideas that don't belong, that aren't biblical. Sure, which in some sense could amount to just about any misunderstanding, right? That's certainly not specific or special to, to this context. Right. A couple things before we kind of move down the line, and I surmise this is going to kind of happen as we move forward, but as, as these men kind of say things, uh, cans of worms, other cans of worms are, are getting opened up here, and I just want to start pulling those, pulling those worms out of there. So you, you mentioned a couple things that I, I kind of want to hit on as we move down the line here, and, and Pastor Brian, you're welcome to continue to comment as well, but you said Calvinist, and maybe everybody that's tuning in is not familiar with what exactly that means. So what, what's a Calvinist? Uh, a biblical Christian. We need somebody back here on the drums. <laughs> like one of those symbol things back there. I actually don't like the phrase, uh, the word Calvinism. Um, I think it's more properly, uh, could be more properly historically referred to as Augustinianism. Uh, because St. Augustine was the first really to articulate uh, a lot of this. Um, but I really think it's simply Pauline theology uh, made manifest in places like Romans 9, Ephesians 1, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, as well as Johannine theology in John 6 and John 19. And one other thing, um, as we expound upon this, you, you mentioned fairness. And I, I think I would certainly agree with the sense that our, our culture and our society kind of propagates this entitlement mentality, right? And oftentimes we, we reflect that onto God and we think that he owes us something. But are we, are we saying then that God is, is not fair? Oh, is he fair? I just, if he I was fair, we'd all, out a little bit. we'd all go to hell. If he, if he was going to be fair, we'd all go to hell. So, um, that's, we, don't, we go to hell for violating a moral standard that's written on our hearts. And we know what we're doing is wrong when we do it. And if God gives us what we deserve, that's what we'll get. And I think one of, um, one of the ways that I know that uh, my understanding of predestination is correct, um, if I could put it so boldly, um, which is historically known as Calvinism, um, encapsulated in the confessions that came out of the Protestant Reformation is that in Romans chapter 9 um, the two most common arguments or most common objections to the doctrine of predestination or God's distinguishing grace are the exact same arguments that Paul deals with. In other words the, the knee-jerk reaction is that's not fair. Um, and so in Romans chapter 9 and verse uh, 13, it says, uh, Just as written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall I say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. And so that's the first objection. That's not fair, that's unjust, that God would shower his love upon one and not upon another. Um, and, and Paul deals with that by then quoting from Exodus that God is a God who has mercy upon whom he has mercy. If God gave us what we deserve, we would all be in hell. Um, and then the second objection is uh, what was somewhat alluded to. Well, what about free will? What about human responsibility? And uh, as the passage unfolds in Romans chapter 9, uh, he says, you, you will say to me, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? Uh, if, how can man be responsible if God is sovereign? And then he answers that in verse 20. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Um, so, in other words, one of the helpful things about 
the Apostle Paul is the way he interacts with arguments, especially in the book of Romans, that it, it clarifies the truth so that you know exactly what he's saying. Because nobody objects to the what's historically known as the Arminian position of predestination by saying, well, that's not fair. Um, or what about human responsibility? That's never an objection, but it's only to what's historically known as Calvinism. And, and it's also one of the same reasons why I believe in justification by faith alone, because in chapter six, he deals with the argument, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, if you're totally forgiven of all your sins, justified before God, why not just keep sinning? Isn't that the most common objection to justification by faith alone? And so that's the beauty of Scripture, the clarity, the pers perspicuity of Scripture is as Paul has interacted with these arguments over and over, he's able to clarify and mow down these arguments, and we're able to see clearly this is, this is what the Scripture teaches. Any other thoughts, Pastor Brian? I think one of the real clear passages that we've been given in the scriptures is uh, Ephesians chapter 1 that really help us in understanding this and it and uh, the clarity of it the simplicity of it. it it doesn't take a seminary degree to read through Ephesians 1 and figure out what's going on there and uh, the clarity just for example right starting at verse 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be home, holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You can go on in that passage. It's just... It's powerful, it's beautiful, and it's clear about um, God's choice, God's predestination, and, and yet the reality that we all still understand, as uh, Pastor Brian was saying, about the, the responsibility we still have yet of choice. Yeah, and there's a lot there even in that short section that you unpacked, even just talking about the fact that God is, has done this predestining in, in love, and that tells us something about his character, right? And it seems like when we get in these discussions, it, it really goes back to what our authority is. We, we need to make sure that we're going back to the same place. We need to make sure that we're looking at the scripture, and we need to make sure we're doing that in a, in a loving way. So as we all kind of agree, we could really certainly unpack that, but I do have questions coming in from those tuning in, and so uh, let's kind of move on and talk about eternal security. What is that? Is this, uh, is this some kind of alarm system that we have, a safe? What, what are we talking about? We're talking about eternal security. Thanks for laughing at my bad jokes, by the way, in the audience. That's fantastic. That's, that's loving. It's, they're used to laughing at our bad jokes, so that's how this... Well, I'm happy to contribute any way I can. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I think, um, I mean, I probably would prefer the term perseverance of the saints, um, although it's kind of the flip side of the same coin, um, eternal security, that be and it's rooted in God's saving grace. So if, if, if we didn't do anything to get in this thing, then we can't do anything to get out of it. Um, but the helpful part about the, t the phrase perseverance of the saints is it encapsulates um, that indeed every believer will persevere to the end. That um, some have said, if, if you have it, you'll never lose it. And if you lose it, you've never had it. Um, and the Apostle Paul really argues that position in, in, in Romans chapter 8. Um, and it starts with predestination. In 830, for those whom he predestined, he also called those whom he called. He also justified those whom he justified. He also glorified. So the same God, the same people who are predestined are the same people who will be glorified. And so because this is what God is doing, uh, you can't thwart his will. And, and of course, Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on and talks about the mediation of Christ and the climaxes with what shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And the answer is nothing, I think. Um, Amen. 
And yet that doesn't mean that, that there's a real responsibility on us to persevere to the end. He said it's those who persevere to the end who are saved. And, and the paradigm of Scripture is that when we see a person not persevere and drop off, that they weren't ever genuinely saved. Because John, 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would have remained with us. But their going out showed that they were not all of us. Great. Well, we can come right back to this, but we are going to take a very short break here. So if you're tuning in with us, we hope you'll come back. We'll see you in a minute. Mahoning Valley. Thank you. Because of you, the rescue mission is celebrating its 125th anniversary. Since 1893, the mission has been feeding, sheltering, and proclaiming the good news that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. The need is greater than ever before. A new homeless person comes in off the streets every six and a half hours. So we need your help. To donate to Mahoning County's only homeless shelter, visit rescuemissionmv.org. As long as I have faith in something, I'm okay, right? I was always taught that you can believe whatever you want as long as you're a good person. I'm spiritual. I mean, I believe God exists. I just don't think that He cares much about me. I would consider myself more spiritual than religious. I'm a pretty good guy, so yeah, I think I'll go to heaven when I die. I mean, I've never killed anyone. if I'm wrong about all of this? Maybe I should see what God has to say. The Bible is the most historically accurate book ever written, even proving scientific facts before modern science did. It's never been shown to be false, so why don't you read it? You might discover the real truth you've been looking for. And welcome back to Ask the Preacher. We're glad you're tuning in with us. Before we broke, we were talking about eternal security. Can someone lose their salvation? Is once saved, always saved a biblical phrase? And when we did break, I just noticed Pastor Brian kind of flipping through his Bible rather furiously there. So uh, Furiously. Not now it's shut, but um, Urgently. So, something to add there, Pastor. Well, I just think it comes from the lips of Jesus himself. Uh, um, in two places in particular. Uh, one is when he says, you know, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Uh, and then he says again in his high priestly prayer um, that it's his will for all that the Father has given him to be with him forever. And he says specifically, speaking of the first generation of disciples, that um, all that the Father has given me he has kept, and not one has been lost except the son of perdition, that is Judas. And that was to fulfill prophecy. That was in the purposes of God. So what God has done in our salvation cannot be undone. Um, that doesn't mean that what we see, for instance, in the case of a Joshua Harris or somebody like that, isn't um, an alarming possibility that people can look really good and you think, oh, here is a person who is filled with the Spirit of God and uh, is someone who I ought to emulate, I ought to read his books, I ought to listen to his teaching, and then to have him walk away having said, I have de-Christianized. And so the big question is, did he have something and lose it, or did he never have anything and uh, just manifested what was truly in his heart? And I would take the latter position. Yeah, and that's certainly very sobering for all of us, isn't it? To see someone at that height of things, and not even that height, but someone who was at least seemingly walking faithfully for so long. That really sobers us to the reality of the fact that even as you guys kind of touched on the tension, hey, what we do and what we believe and how we live, it, it matters, right? That, that transformation didn't happen overnight, did it? So these things are important, and, and I appreciate your insight onto, again, somewhat of a controversial topic, but that's kind of why we're here too, right? If these questions were all easy, we wouldn't need y'all. So, well, we still need you. Don't, don't take that. <laughs> I'm not sure you need us now, to be honest. All right, let's, uh, let's move on here. I mean, I don't know if I want to ask you this one. 
Let's talk eschatology a little bit here, just because it's always on everybody's mind. Um, and then this should be interesting too, just, well, because it's always interesting, but let's, let's talk a little eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last things, right? So let's talk pre-trib, post-trib, pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill, whatever kind of mill you, you might be siding with there. Talk to us a little bit about where you guys stand on this. And millennial. Yeah, me too. Pan out, pan out in the end. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sort of a reluctant convert to all millennialism. I was raised. I, I became a Christian when I was uh, right around my 15th birthday, and <laughs> was kind of indoctrinated in dispensational theology. Um, and didn't know there was any different way that Bible believing folks looked at those things. And uh, it was only later in life as I uh, began to explore the, the richness of historic Christian theology that I found out that that way of looking at things um, is literally newer than the steam engine, the brass rifle cartridge, and the hypodermic syringe. So it's not a very old theology, and the people that came up with it were actually quite clear that they were coming up with something novel and that they were unique and a unique repository of the truth. And so right away, then, alarm bells ought to be ringing. Um, but I, I tend to take, uh, a, I guess what I'd call a quiet amillennial point of view, and that's uh, just very simply that Jesus will return in history one day, and that will be the end of time, and he will take us to be with himself forever, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And uh, it's much less intricate than some of the other schemes that I've seen. And um, so that's kind of made sense to me. Well, even though you're quiet and reluctant by your own admission, we're happy to welcome you into the camp of the historic Protestant position. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't speak for everyone, though. So, I was going to say, there's a guy here that went to John MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor uh, Matt. Yeah, I, um, I, I guess I would still put myself in the category of pre-millennial. Um, I haven't been able to find a better um, understanding of Revelation chapter 20. Um, just the, the arguments I've heard have not been very compelling against it. Um, and uh, although with that, I tend to be more of a kind of a historic pre-millennialist. So. Historic as opposed to dispensational. Pretty much, yeah. I, I, I probably wouldn't be, um, yeah, some of my positions wouldn't be welcome. Yeah, so pre-millennial means that Jesus comes back before a thousand-year kingdom on the earth. All millennial, alpha, privative, meaning no millennium, which is somewhat of a misnomer. It's just that the idea would be that we are in the thousand-year kingdom of Revelation 20. Um, and then post-millennial, <clears throat> is that Jesus comes back after a thousand year kingdom, although they would say it's not necessarily exactly a thousand years, but it's a long period of time where there'll be kind of a golden age of Christianity, um, and then uh, Jesus will come back. And, and that's the tie to Revelation 20 then, that, that thousand years, that, that millennium. Right. Yeah, I think in my studies, um, it definitely has um, grown over time. And, um, but I've definitely I've come to the historic premillennial view. There's a great um, oh little book I had to read in seminary that really started me down that was just just called Four Views of the Millennium, and. Um, was just helpful to understand the differences, where they're going, and the biblical understanding, and to put that together. And, um, and so I've, I've found, you know, amazing believers, pastors, scholars, that are a million times smarter than I am, that have a different view. So we hold these things with a with an awful lot less certainty than we hold justification by grace through faith. And we hold them with a great amount of grace and understanding. And, um, and that's, the, I think, the beauty of, 
of our uh, commitment to the scriptures is where it is clear, we're going to be clear and we're going to take a bullet to the head. And where it's not um, maybe as crystal clear as we all might want it to be, we can be gracious and kind to each other and show that brotherhood that we have and uh, an understanding. Yeah, that's well said. And Pastor Brian and I will be waiting to square up with you all in the parking lot after this is all over. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, one, one thing that might be helpful even in thinking about these things, and, and it's not that this topic isn't important. We, we all may have our convictions on these things and other areas where we may disagree. Um, Al Mohler wrote an article that I found helpful. He calls it doctrinal triage. And, you know, if you go in the emergency room, you know, there's a triage nurse who's there. What's their job? Triage from the French to sort. They're to sort out what's most urgent. So the guy with the, you know, gunshot wound goes ahead of the person who has, you know, back pain or whatever. Um, well, when it comes to doctrine, um, it, you know, there's wisdom in having a, a kind of triage. And the way this article outlines it is that, you know, there's first order doctrine where these things are those things that are essential to Christianity, non-negotiable, we don't compromise, we don't budge on them. And then there's certain doctrines that in the second level, um, we may call them ecclesiastical doctrines. These are doctrines that um, while they may not be essential to salvation, they're probably gonna put us in different local churches. Um, you know, and, you know, so there may be things, you know, like views on church government, um, baptism, things like that, that, that is probably going to put us in different local churches. Um, and then there's third level doctrines, which you might consider more eschatological doctrines um, that, that, you know, we could probably even have difference of agreement, even within the context of a local church. Um, and uh, the problem with theological liberalism is there's nothing in category one. There's no essential doctrines. The problem with fundamentalism is everything's in category number one. And, and so there's wisdom, and I don't have a chapter and verse for that, but at least in my mind, it's been a helpful sorting of the reality that there's certain doctrines that are more important. And I think a fairly good case can be made when you look throughout church history uh, and, and, and brothers disagreeing over certain things and, and prioritizing what's most important when you see some of the church confessions and whatnot. Yeah, and that's actually a great place. Uh, sorry, Pastor Brian, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Um, Peter says uh, that, you know, there are many things in Scripture that are hard to understand. And when you get things that are hard to understand, things that are less clear, which there are, then you're going to have differences of opinion about them. But uh, I like what Alistair Begg says. He says, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And I think that's entirely correct. Yeah, well said. And uh, I just to reiterate what these what these guys have said, it's we're not saying that your view of how this is all going to quote unquote pan out doesn't matter. I think if you look, you, you see the the eschatological focus all throughout all throughout the whole of Scripture. Right. Like Paul, how does Paul make a statement in Romans eight eighteen that the suffering he's currently experiencing isn't going to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to him? I mean, that's that's eschatology. That's something he's looking forward to. You see the same thing in Hebrews chapter. 11. And initially I kind of was skeptical, uh, a little timid around this question, but what a great illustration of how we should handle these things when you see these three men up here not holding to the same position, and yet they're shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, brothers in Christ, all here for our help and, and serving the same gospel of Christ together. So what, what an example, what a, what a prudent question actually. So, thanks for being patient. We do have our first live question here from the audience. If you could just say your name and the church that you represent and your question, too. My name is Brandy. Um, I'm from Poland Village Baptist Church, and this is to all, th all three of you. Um, I just briefly want to know, when did you first realize you were being called to become a pastor? Great question. Christ. Personal question. Thank you. Me first, I guess. Um, I, I knew I was called to the pastoral ministry within about six weeks of becoming a Christian. 
Um, my mom bought me the biography of a Presbyterian minister. Uh, it was called A Man Called Peter, written by his wife, Catherine Marshall. He was the chaplain to the Senate during World War II. He died in 1949 of a heart attack at a relatively young age. And I read that, and I closed it, and I said, well, that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm supposed to be a Presbyterian minister. We were Methodists. And um, <laughs> all these years later, here I am. That's awesome. Yeah, I think um, I like to think of you know, you have what we might call the more subjective internal call. Um, you know, probably Paul's alluding to that in in First Timothy three when he says that any man who aspires to the office of an overseer, he he, he aspires to a good work. Um, and then you have the more objective, you know, call from the church to make sure you're qualified to do that. And, and so, um, yeah, for me, the, the more subjective call, if you will, um, was, was in college and I was involved teaching the Bible and, and, uh, it was just growing in the Lord as I, you know, had opportunities to teach the Bible in my local church and then on campus involved in a campus ministry. And uh, it was just kind of like, man, like to be able to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and I was um, in the nursing program at, the, at that time. So I just figured I'll finish out my nursing degree and I need to get more trained to, to actually do this. So that was mid college. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. For me, I, I didn't uh, grow up in a Christian home. And my cross-country coach in high school, Mr. Bromwitz, um, invited me to a father-son banquet uh, to him at First Baptist Church in Freeport, Illinois. And so I went with him, and if it's hard for you to imagine, but I was pretty much a geek, a nerd in school. <laughs> and um, so some of my friends were there, and I started attending there. And... Uh, Family didn't attend anything. It came time for uh, to go to camp. This was between my sophomore and junior year of high school. And the church provided me the money to be able to go to church camp and Iowa regular Baptist camp in Clear Lake, Iowa. And it, you know, it's as vivid today to me really as it was then. It just, the Lord just captured my life and my heart. And, and I found, uh, uh, that he loved me and that really was the thing that changed my life was to realize uh, the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ in my life and um, from really that moment on um, I can't I just couldn't imagine doing anything else with my life but serving this God who loved me and uh, whatever it took however long whatever whatever he wanted yeah, and um, it's my privilege today to to serve him. I I'm a, I tell people all the time. I'm the you know I'm the kid from the wrong side of the street. You know from the all this stuff. I shouldn't be uh, Jesus Christ, Mr. Abramowitz, and uh, for sure it's the greatest privilege of my life. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, guys, and just what a. What a constant encouragement is to see men who take these things seriously. Next question coming in from the audience tuning in on Facebook. It's from Mindy Regstad. With the recent situations of fallen pastors such as James McDonald, Tullian, Chavidian, I think I got that, Bill Heibel, etc. How are everyday Christians to guard themselves from being skeptical and cynical of pastors, leaders, and teachers, and quote-unquote famous good biblical leaders in the church today? That's a really good question. Um, I will say that very often our culture, uh, our Christian culture, our celebrity Christian culture engenders pride in pastors and it engenders envy in pastors that don't have the chops to get to the celebrity status. And the whole thing is quite toxic. Um, I, uh, I would say one of the best things you can do is find a good local church and know your pastor and support your pastor and don't spend a lot of time uh, dealing with the rock stars of the pastoral world, honestly. Um, there's just too many temptations there and there's not enough 
um, character to go around to handle them all, unfortunately. Uh, it is a very sad situation, and uh, it reminds me all the time that my judgment is stricter as a teacher of the Word of God. Um, and if I stumble, I take, may take a lot of people with me. So it's kind of sobering and frightening. I think what you mentioned, um, you mentioned their pride. I think that for us, then, the challenge is humility. For us, is the is that Philippians 2, to kind of let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. And what's it, what's it talking about? His humility. And, um, and one of the great um, practical realities of living out Reformed Calvinistic theology is to realize um, that it's all about Christ. It's not about us ever. And so that when you can hold on to that, um, um, that, that just keeps everything in its proper perspective. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's also, um, it, it's important for us to understand, as I think it was Whitfield said, the best of men are men at best, and we live in a fallen world. And um, I agree with everything Brian said. There's a kind of a celebrity culture that doesn't help this, but um, in one sense, it's almost inevitable, you know, with, I mean, you think of Spurgeon, who had thousands of people coming to hear him preach. Um, Third John, verse 9, John writes about uh, a man named Diotrephes who, who loved to be first. And, um, you know, so you, you see you see that this is not something that is necessarily new um, today, um, but it's, it's as old as the apostles are old. Um, I, I think one of the more grievous things is not so much that it happens, um, although that's grievous, but, but the way in which these men are able to then reboot their ministries and um, within weeks, Julian Trevedians has a ministry position at another church. Um, there's recent posts about James McDonald is him restarting a ministry. Um, it's just, that's appalling. Um, but I, I think Brian's counsel was, was spot on. Just you need to understand that while we can learn from gifted men, uh, you know, we've all benefited from different guys, teachers over the years, or R.C. Sproles, Pipers, whatever. But understand that is, that is not, unless you're actually part of their local church, that is not your pastor. Um, that is somebody uh, who, you know, the Lord may have gifted and, and, you know, be a part of a local church with a local pastor who actually cares for your soul. Um, uh, because, you know, John Piper's not going to be the one who's there when you're dying. And, uh, you know, or when your baby's born or, or whatever. Um, and so uh, we can benefit from some of these gifted teachers. But, but yeah, I think on, on a personal level, as has been mentioned, humility is, is so important. And, you know, keeping close walk with the Lord is vital. How, how to, I guess the question is related, how to help somebody, you know, with Distrust again. I think it just goes back. You got to be a part of a local church where there's leaders over you who you can trust. Yeah, that community is important. We live amongst each other, and we see each other, and we interact with one another, and we live amongst each other. There's there's no substitute for that community, and that's how God ordained the church. That's how we designed it, and we're kind of in a novel struggle right now with applying that properly because we live in an age where all of these other men are accessible at the push of a button, right? Which can be a tremendous blessing, but something that we also have to temper, right? We're going to take our second break for the evening, so thank you for your patience, and we'll see you in a minute. When 
151,000 people die every day on planet Earth. That means that 6,300 people die every hour. And by the time this video is over, 105 people will have died in 60 seconds. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. After a person dies, they will either go to heaven forever or hell, a place of eternal conscious torment. The Bible says that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead so that a person doesn't have to go to hell. If you repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven and go to heaven. Time's up. Have you repented and trusted in Christ? What are you waiting for? They've served our valley for 125 years, and now it's time to celebrate the rescue mission of the Mahoning Valley. Join me, Rich Morgan, from WKBN, and be part of the anniversary benefit dinner for the rescue mission. Come out Friday, February 16th, to Mr. Anthony's Banquet Center. Enjoy a fantastic dinner of live music and learn how the mission changes lives every day. Call now to get your tickets. Join me Friday, February 16th, and support the rescue mission of the Mahoning Valley. Okay, I'm here with Mick, and Mick, you have 60 seconds. Explain God. <laughs> Go. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's that's a really interesting question. Well, uh, God, there is one God, uh, the living and true God. He is uh, one and yet three at the same time. This is the doctrine of the Trinity, which is, uh, to, in some regard, unexplainable. And yet we know that there is one God, but this God exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has certain attributes. He is holy. He is just. He is loving. He is merciful. And these things are true about Him from eternity to eternity. He can never stop being who He is. And that's a great thing for us. And God, in His infinite mercy, decided to have this plan of redemption whereby he would be glorified and bring a people for his own possession to worship and love him in gratitude through faith for all of eternity. And we're the recipients of that. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Ask the Preacher, where we are answering tough questions that you all might have for these men. And we continue our discussion with a question from Gloria, and she wants to know which comes first, faith or regeneration? And I know we've kind of already alluded to, to some of the tension in this question and, and some of our other questions, but maybe if you could specifically and succinctly kind of talk about that if that's possible. Regeneration. Very succinct. Thank you. Literalist. <laughs> I think it's helpful to, th to answer the question. We're talking logically, not necessarily chronologically. Um, this, this all happens at the same time. It's not like somebody's regenerated and then, you know, 15 years down the road, they believe. Um, it's, it's, it all happens at the same time. But logically, as you read the scriptures, as Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins, as John six forty four says, no one can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You know, John 60, 6, 65, 66, no one can come unto me unless it's been granted. All those cannots of the scripture, so that unless... God quickens, regenerates the heart, a person will not believe. And so in that sense, it, it has to precede faith. And I would also say that the same distinction that you made between faith and regeneration is a, a distinction that's made between faith and repentance. Um, it's that we repent believingly and believe repentantly as we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And so one of the, uh, one of the more famous Reformed theologians of the early 20th century likened, rather than having a, an order of salvation that had things laid out logically, although there's a place for that, um, he liked to talk about union with Christ and to refer to this whole process of coming to Christ uh, like spokes on a wheel. 
And as we're united to him, all of these benefits and blessings become ours. So I think you can talk about both the logical order and the experiential order and the um, ultimate end of the, of the whole process, which is union with Christ. And a question from the audience. Thank you for that, by the way. Question, I've... Um, Give us your name and your church. John Holden, Sovereign Grace Chapel. Thank you. I've read that Martin Luther said, pray and let God worry. Do you think that was before or after his conversion? And do you agree with it? Pray and let God worry. That's the quote. Um, yeah, I, I honestly have never heard that from Martin Luther, so I, I couldn't tell you whether that was after he was cut. Even, even answering that question historically is, is rather difficult to pin down, you know, when Luther was converted. Um, but, uh, I mean, it seems to me pretty similar to Philippians 4, 6. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So it seems pretty close to summarizing that pray and let God worry. Obviously, that let God worry needs to be qualified. God doesn't worry. But, you know, again, First Peter 5, 7, cast your cares, cast your worries upon the Lord because he cares for you. Uh, again, not that God worries, but he's, he's the sovereign, so we can trust him. And prayer is trust that talks. Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that question, John. We'll throw a thank you out there for Lincoln, too. (laughs) So, guys, a question that came in. Reference Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 5 says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Can you talk about the perfect God regretting having done something? And, and tie in the fall of man and, and maybe the implications for, for our fallen nature and just kind of how that all plays out. Because it, it seems a little, at a, at a cursory glance, it, it's, it's a little interesting that, that God would be grieved, be sorry that he had done something. I believe the King James Version actually says repented. Um, it, Calvin said, and I think, I don't, I'm not, I'm sure others have said, but Calvin said that when God talks to us in the scriptures, he accommodates himself to us like a nursemaid lisping to a baby. And uh, there are some uh, senses in which we can only understand God by what I guess I'd call divinely ordained similes, um, that God uh, speaks to us and he likens us to human beings who are changeable, and um, I'm sorry, he likens himself to human beings who are changeable, and he, so he doesn't really have an arm, um, he doesn't really have a, a right hand, and all these other things, because he's a spirit and he doesn't have a body, but he's accommodating his language to us so that we can understand. And uh, there is a sense in which the absolute will of God is uh, a mystery, and uh, there are things that work out, as the Westminster Confession says, contingently or necessarily. And um, one of the things that, uh, that we have to come to grips with is God's accommodating language and what that will mean to us um, as we experience his will in history, as it works its way out in time. Yeah, I, we mentioned Genesis 6. I thought you were going to ask me about enough. Yeah, we, we are not there yet. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get too comfortable. <laughs> now it's like five minutes from now. Oh, okay. No, I'm kidding. Well, not really, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think um, the, the category um, 
you know, the, the, those things, those areas when God likens himself to a human, they're, they're sometimes called anthropomorphisms. And, um, you know, and, and I think you have one there where, where God, he, he doesn't have a plan B. Um, and, and, and so in that sense, he doesn't regret. This was part of his will all along. But at the same time, it communicates something to us about God, his hatred of sin, his, his grief, if you will, over uh, the wickedness of man. And you obviously you see other passages like in the book of Jonah, um, where, again, it says Jonah uh, chapter 4, that God repented uh, from the calamity that he had purposed concerning Nineveh. Um, but as you read the passage, you realize like that was plan. That was God's plan all along was to rescue Nineveh to uh, to grant them repentance, and that's why Jonah knew. Uh, that's why Jonah ran. He didn't want them to be saved, um, and so um, so yeah. But again, at the same time, it tells us something of of God's character, um, you know, and he, he does lisp to us in these passages. Yeah, I think I um, just recently was teaching in 1 Samuel, and in chapter 15, it mentions about the Lord regretting um, Saul and then his choices to sin. And then um, um, Samuel, at the end of, the, at the end of uh, 1 Samuel 15, it says, um, Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now again, in his sovereign plan, he knew exactly what he was doing and where he was going and what's happening and, and this whole process that's going here. But it, it, there is no um, high-fiving in heaven, even though God's plan is, going, is happening in the fall of Saul and the evil choices that he made. There's grief. Samuel is grieved. The Lord is, the Lord is grieved. Sin is grievous in its effect in, in, um, um, in what it's doing, so much to the point that, you know, God in his eternal plan sent his son to die on the cross because of the grievous, serious, uh, nature of the reality of sin, and so the so it would be unbecoming of the true God to not grieve um, over sin and all that He has a you know don't grieve the Holy Spirit um, as the Scripture says. And so I think it's a it's it's a picture into the reality that. Um, that there is, um, as they're trying to communicate with us through the scripture, through the anthropomorphisms, to help us understand um, the brokenness of his heart, even in the midst of his plan, towards the reality of sin and what it's doing to humankind. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking in that same context in First Samuel 15, verse 29, you know, exactly. says, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. So in the same chapter, yep. it says he changed his mind and he regretted. It also says he's not a man that exactly. should, should change That's his That's exactly mind. right. And, uh, and obviously, so the tension is trying to harmonize those two and understand that, you know, God does communicate something to us and likening himself to, uh, to man in the way in which he regrets things and changes his mind. I think it was Hodge that said when this kind of language is used, God is acting towards us as a human being would act if he were animated by that particular passion or emotion. So his anger, his grief, um, his pleasure even, um, are, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor, but it's a divinely ordained metaphor. It's something he's chosen to use to communicate himself. Thanks, guys, for your insight on that. And we'll go to our last question for the evening, which is coming live from our audience. Hi, I'm Devin. Um, I go to Sovereign Grace Chapel. My question is not as deep theologically right now, but I think it's a question a lot of people have is, how do you pick which translation of the Bible you use? <clears throat> and then I know you don't just use one, you go back and forth to different ones, but 
How would a new believer decide which translation and be secure in knowing which one to use and then be, be able to understand those terms when we haven't gone to seminary and learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew? I think you ought to just use the Bible that Paul used, which is the King James Version. <laughs> Come joking. on now. Come on now. The, um, my, my favorite translation, honestly, is the New American Standard Bible, um, but it is the clunkiest, most awkward rendering of the original Greek and Hebrew into English that is possible. Amen. Um, <laughs> One of, one of my professors referred to it as English as it is never spoken. Um, I, so I, uh, after a lot of uh, thrashing and flailing around, I finally settled on the, uh, the English Standard Version. And I think that's what most um, kind of, I guess what I'd call, well, definitely most Reformed people are kind of leaning towards these days as far as a good readable modern translation. It's not perfect, um, but it is pretty good. And I think it's trustworthy. And if you don't like the version you've got, they seem to want to update it every couple of years anyway. So, um, so I, that's the one that I would tend to prefer. I kind of have got a lot of folks in my own church that use the NIV, um, which is, um, uh, I refer to it as the non-inspired version, but that's just tongue in cheek. Um, it's okay, it's okay. Listen, I'm the only one allowed to tell jokes here, so this, that's like number three from you, Pastor Brian. Let's, let's tone it down a little bit. No. We, we've obviously got a, a fine, well-prepared scholarly guy here, so exactly. we need some comic relief. No doubt. Yeah, I think um, it's helpful to understand the, the translation philosophy behind different translations, and, and usually it's a spectrum. So. You know, um, there's, the spectrum is the, the philosophy of a formal equivalent translation. Actually, I'll put that on the right. Um, a formal equivalent. That's a more word-for-word -word translation. Um, and then a dynamic equivalent. That's more meaning-for-meaning. Meaning. Um, so, uh, so the New American Standard, which is the, 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 the translation I preach from, um, it's, it's probably the most formal equivalent translation in the English language. Uh, on, on the kind of other extreme, you might have like the New English Bible, the New Living Translation. Um, not the Living Translation, the Living Translation is, is more of a paraphrase. Um, although there's certain parts of it that are actually fairly word for word. Um, but it is more of a paraphrase. Um, and so then there's a spectrum. There's kind of along the way, you know, so, you, you know, you have the New American Standard, for, you know, very formal English Standard, you know, New King James, King James, you know, uh, probably the uh, Holman Christian Standard, the HC uh, 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 Bible, Holman Christian Standard Bible, um, I like to call it the hardcore Southern Baptist Bible. <laughs> um, but uh, that's kind of in the middle. The, the NIV, the, the 1984 NIV is probably somewhere um, past the ESV, past, you know, the New King James. It's kind of more middle of the road. Uh, I'm a little bit more concerned about some of the, um, the, the, the most recent NIV and it's some of its gender neutral same. translation. Yeah, um, same. I, I kind of get nauseated over that. Um, the, the, the 84 NIV I would prefer, but it's a dead translation and it's on my Logos Bible software. It's mm -hmm. the only place you can find it. But so if somebody's a new Christian, um, again, it's helpful. It is helpful to know that, that okay, some translations are going to be more meaning for meaning. And so that might be helpful for them to start reading the Bible, you know, in, um, you know, Holman Christian Standard translation. It's going to be, it's going to flow a little bit more. Um, but I think if, if you're going to actually, you know, really work hard to understand what the text says, you, you are going to want to move towards maturity. You will want to move towards an English standard or a New American standard or, you know, even a New King James. New King James, the New Testament, the, the manuscript pool behind the New Testament, I'm not thrilled about, but overall it's a good translation. 
I think something to add here, um, uh, what they've said is excellent on all the translation stuff, was just to realize, you know, what God has done in preserving his word for us so that we can hold, you know, within our own English language from the uh, originals and the copies that we have, that we can hold with such confidence in God's word. And that it's one of the things you want to g encourage a new believer is that don't get lost in all this translation stuff. Don't get lost in all this, you know, in-house kind of weird stuff that we got going on as Christians. It's God's word and grab it and it's true and it's real and devour it and, and study it and then go to great church and do the, you know, get in studies and, and uh, we can have such confidence um, in God's word, not just in like a faith confidence, but actually in a science confidence, in a historical confidence, in a, you know, uh, in psychological. All, I mean, just a real confidence that's not, um, it's not pretend, it's not blind, it's real. And God has pre given us his word in such a way um, that is really fantastic to, give, to truly be that light and that guiding. Uh, for our life and the truth. I will say also sometimes there is a value for me in stepping away from the more literal word for word and doing something like Eugene Peterson's The Message um, just to get kind of a, there's that little shock when you read a familiar passage and he's put his kind of spin on it for better or for worse and it uh, very often it's like it's almost like a blast of cool air on a cold day or on a warm day. I mean, and it's, it's like, um, sometimes it's a blast of cool air on a cold day, too. <laughs> but there's just this sense of, um, of, a, of a, oh, I hadn't looked at it that way. And, you know, maybe that's worth checking into. It sounds like you're describing that almost as a supplement. Yeah, I wouldn't make it my main diet. I wouldn't preach out of it, for instance. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. If we could get one more round of applause for our panel here. That does conclude the first Ask the Preacher event. Just want to again give a shout out to Gregory Films for putting this whole thing on and just the vision there. And just what a cool thing that we're able to meet here, whether you're here or there or wherever, and just talk about Christianity, talk about the Lord, talk about the Bible. He's, he's been so kind to us. So I know Gregory Films would appreciate your feedback, whether you were here, whether you were tuning in. And Lord willing, this certainly will not be the first of these events. So spread the word, and, and we'd love to see you here next time. And I would just leave you with my favorite Bible verse, actually, 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. And God has been so good to us. Thanks again for tuning in tonight.